Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from JB1, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It's a free call. 1-855-450-NOAH. That's one 450 6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you this hour. As another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off. Full phone lines at the start of the program. I like to see that. 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 855-450-6624. Uh, obviously, our call screener has not had a chance to get to all these, so we're just going to start taking you guys live. Uh, 2150, I guess we'll call you that. Hey, you're on the Ask Noah Show. Uh, hi, how are you? Excellent, sir. How are you doing? Is that me? It is. Okay. What's up? Uh, so, uh, sorry about that. So, I have a question involving Multipath. So, at work, I have a server that needs to upgrade from RHEL 6 to RHEL 7. It's, connect- it's an NFS server that connects to three SAN devices. Uh, that uh, communicate over fiber channels via uh, two redundant MDS switches, and multipath is used for that redundancy. I don't really understand multipath, and basically what do I need to learn between LVM and multipath before I do this RHEL 7 upgrade? Ooh. Uh, so are you, the only, uh, are you the only administrator that's working on this, or is there a team? The only Linux guy in the shop. Man, so this this all falls down on your head if this doesn't go right. Exactly. Um, there is. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. This is this is the fun thing about doing live radio. Is can I get this on the air? There was a, a fantastic video series um, by a company called Flockbox. That uh, uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, San to fiber sand channels redundancy and multiplat. Okay, so I have a. I'm gonna have a link for you in the show notes. Obviously, this is just not something I can. I can answer. I, I can't. We just can't go in that, that in depth, right? On a on a on a five minute radio call. But what I can do is I can point you in the right direction. And uh, these guys have done a fantastic job. I've actually used them a couple of times to to wrap my head around, uh, you know, around some theories or or get the tools that I need to get the job done. And um, they've just got a couple different little video series, basically like a, a PowerPoint presentation with the guy kind of explaining the stuff. But one of the neat things that they allow you to do is they actually allow you to contact the people that created the video. And so I have sent in questions and just said, you explain this. You got me 90% of the way there. Now, here's my specific environment variables. What can I do a little bit differently? And then they'll spit back and say, oh, okay, well, in that particular case, we would recommend, you know, X, Y, or Z. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'll make sure I check out the show notes for that. Um, I did have one additional question, if I may. It uh, pertains to the show itself. Yeah, you um, bet. Just prior, uh, to the sh- just prior to the show, I was listening to hold music. Uh, or maybe it was something on the live feed just before us. Is there any way that I might be able to get a track list? Because there was this awesome guitar that I was listening to, and I want to hear that in higher quality. <laughs> yes, the uh, the song that you're referring to is a track called... It, it's funny enough that the name of the song is actually called Guitar Sound. It's by a gentleman uh, by the name of Ronald Jenkins. And um, yeah, I can. Uh, I'll put a link to his album uh, in the show notes as well, and uh, and and you can you can purchase a, so- a song if you'd like, or you can find it on YouTube. You know, wh- wh- however you like to get music. But it is a really fantastic piece of music. Uh, just a little bit of inside juju. The reason that that song is is on the hot button page is because it's like a seven minute long track, and it just the whole song just builds and has this beautiful mus- musical melody that kind of enc- it just kind of it it puts you in like this trance. And so what's fantastic about it is I can kick that thing off and then I don't have to worry about the computer for the next five to, t- you know, somewhere between five and ten minutes. And then I can get everything else kind of done. Then I'm sure you notice and we kill that and, and go to our pre sound track uh, when the actual show starts, starts off. But, yeah, yeah. it's the the, na- the name of the track is Guitar Sound by Ronald Jenkins. And, uh, yeah, we'll have a link for that in you, as for you as well in the show notes. All right. Well, thank you very much, Noah. That's all I needed. Yeah, man. Good. Uh, great question. And uh, and th- sharp ear, too. Man, fantastic. Chaz calls from New York. Hey, Chaz. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Noah, hey, I didn't want to interrupt you uh, last week because you were on a bit of a roll. And uh, 
great job on that rant, but I'm back and I got more questions about uh, my eventual Steam OS changeover that I hope you can help with. Yes, I would love to. What's up? All right. So what I want to do is kind of give you a rundown of what my current uh, Windows Tower has going for it right now and then see if you can help me figure out a comparable setup uh, that would use Steam OS. So right now, essentially, I have a setup of five hard drives, if you can believe it. I've got an M.2 uh, hard drive that's directly into the motherboard. It's kind of my OS drive uh, for Windows, and it's where all the programs are installed as well. Then I have three 500 gigabyte SSDs that are in uh, a storage pool with uh, the Windows 10 storage spaces technology so that the computer views it as one hard drive so I don't have to constantly manage, okay, well, I put Doom here and Bioshock Infinite here and Half-Life 2 here, so I have, you know, X, Y, and Z space left. And it's just all in one pool. And then the, uh, the final hard drive is just a two terabyte spinning plate drive. And the only reason I use that is because I have a utility called Steam Mover that uh, essentially creates kind of two Steam libraries almost. And it allows me to move games that I'm not playing very much over to the... Um, uh, over to the spinning plate hard drive so that they don't have to be taking up space on the SSD since they don't need to be accessed as fast. So I guess gotcha. the main part of that question is what is the best way to set up kind of a uh, storage pool type thing under Linux or am I just going to have to manually manage each of those three SSDs when I can start when I start installing games via Steam? Yeah, no, uh, the answer is you can do either. It's your choice. Linux is obviously capable of it. It's if what you would choose to do. So if I woke up in your shoes, Chaz, and I had your machine and had your specification set, here's what I would do. I would take that M.2 drive and I would separate that out in its own little world and that would become my boot and operating system drive. And that, that drive, its function in life would be to get my system booted to a usable state and the absolute minimum amount of applications or files that I need to do my day-to-day -day job. Then the second thing that I would do is take that, you said you had a cluster of drives that you're using? Yes, three. So I would take I would take all remaining I would take those cluster drives I probably include the spinning disk in that that, that you're referring to in that uh, in that driver as well, and I would use LVM to group all of those drives physically together as one logical drive uh, layout drive mapping for the operating system, and then layer my uh, uh, you know like an X4 f file system on top of that, and that would become my uh, game drive so to speak or my the, where I would store all of my games and, and running files and anything that's large, it, it has any size to the thing, I'd be storing those in, the, uh, in, in, that, in that drive array. And what that will enable you to do, Chaz, is if you ever need to reinstall your operating system, you don't ever have to touch the, uh, your data sets, your data files to do that. And on, on the other side of things, if you ever want to reinstall your uh, data stuff or you want to clear anything out, you don't have to monkey with your operating system. So even if Steam goes you know, belly up, you still have the ability of wiping that, that drive array clean or swapping drives out. I will tell you one thing that has really been on my mind in the past couple of weeks. 8 terabyte and 10 terabyte Western Digital Reds have been coming out. And so I am reevaluating all of my storage needs and saying any place that I need a drive, if it's LVM, I've, I'm already doing this. I'm pulling the old drives out. I swap them in one at a time. I remove it from the LVM cluster. I put a Western Digital 8 terabyte or 10 terabyte red in there. I, it, I add that back to the volume group, let all of the data migrate back onto that, and then, uh, and then, and then so, forth, so on and so forth as I'm continually swapping out these older, smaller, um, less reliable drives. And so if I'm you and, and I'm in those shoes and I have the ability to kind of start fresh and I'm, I'm planning it out as well as you're planning it out, I wouldn't want any problems down the road. And so because of that, I would be I put a little effort and energy into setting up a, a, a system with a bit of sophistication, thus that I have some flexibility down the road if I ever want to swap drives out, so on and so forth. All right. Um, now, I've never used LVM before, so would you be so kind as to toss uh, kind of like a beginner's resource in the show notes for me to take a look at? Yeah, you bet. I'll give you the I'll give you the the, the nickel cent tour here on the air. So the, essentially, the idea of LVM is LVM stands for logical volume management, and what LVM essentially is is the ability to take a 
a, a lot of physical drives and group them together into a physical volume group or a PVM. And once we have collected them into a PVM, we then layer a logical uh, volume group on top of them. So in other words, something that we're going to expose to the operating system as a partition. And um, we call that a volume group or a VG. And then a after we have the volume group, then we can create a partition on that volume group. Now, the advantage to doing that, because it sounds like it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a cluster to wrap your mind around, but... The advantage to doing that is, is twofold. The first advantage is if you ever have a drive that fails, provided that you have more drive space available in the array. So I guess to back up a little bit, if you have four, if you have eight terabytes of drive space and they're in maybe let's say they're in two terabyte drive drives each, as long as you have two terabytes or more free, you can migrate all of the data off of the drive that is failing pull that drive out and replace it with a newer drive, even a bigger drive, and add that back into the volume group. The other thing that we do, and we do this all the time, Chaz, is we'll get a call from a business that has an LVM system that we've set up, and they'll say, hey, we have a problem with our LVM system. We need more space. And so we won't remove any drives, but we will go back into their system, add a couple of new drives, add those to the system, and without even rebooting the system, we're able to get them more storage. And so it's a very fast and flexible way to manage storage, provided that you have the ability to start fresh, which it kind of sounds like you do. Yeah, it sounds like pretty much exactly what I'm looking for. I'm guessing that uh, all this would be accomplished using the uh, expert install utility on a SteamOS uh, boot drive as opposed to the automated? Yeah, so as far as how it works with actual SteamOS, I I've not tried to set up LVM on SteamOS, however... I have plenty of times in my career gone into a place that didn't have LVM when they started, and it's an Ubuntu base or a CentOS base, and we have added, there's an LVM utility that you install, and uh, and then there's either graphic one if there's a desktop, or there's a you can do it with command line if there's not, and um, and we go back and add LVM in for a storage unit. So even if it wasn't in there, as long as SteamOS, as long as it's still based on Debian or Ubuntu, you you still be able to get the, the requisite tools to get that system up and running. Um, and yes, I will absolutely include a beginner's guide in the show notes for you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, man. Yes, thank you very much for the call. Again, one 450 no, it's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Steve calls from North Carolina. Hey, Steve, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I've been running Linux now for a few weeks, and uh, I don't see any reason not to continue, so I'd like to make this my, my daily use computer. Um, we've always used Macs here at the house before. And I need to bring over um, the the files from the Mac over to the Linux unit. And I've got a couple of questions, and you may have partially answered it with the last call. Okay. Um, up until now, uh, we've always used individual external drives with the Time Machine uh, for backup. And um, I guess we could do something similar with that with uh, the Linux. But is there a good rule of thumb on where maybe a network type of drive might be recommended over each computer? We have several uh, backing up itself. I mean, yep. one for one with an external. Yes, I don't know that I would necessarily go as far as saying one to one. That might be a bit. Ex I mean, you certainly could do that. You'd certainly have a lot of redundancy doing that. Um, but what, what typically what you do, and this applies to both small to medium businesses as well as home users, uh, Steve, what we usually see people doing is they will t they'll buy like a Western Digital four terabyte or maybe four of them, and they will put them into a uh, uh, either gently used older box or they'll buy a dedicated box for it, and they'll install a, a, a okay. software called FreeNAS. And uh, what FreeNAS will do for you is it will create, like you say, a network share that all of your Macs and your Linux machines can access simultaneously, and you'll be able to seamlessly move data between those machines. You can automatic, you can schedule the, either one of those machines, either on the Linux side or on the Mac side, to back up data to those shares. And that file, what we call file okay. server then, essentially becomes a central point in your house where all of the data can be stored. And then... 
to you know to 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 uh, to expand on that, then it becomes much easier to back up and maintain because you only have one place to look. Okay, so you would recommend free NAS. That's, I would. Yeah. Uh, is that that's a, a piece of software? It is. Yeah. It's a. It's it. It, it really what it is. Uh, if I'm being, you know, the full answer is really it's an entire operating system in and of itself. But is it in an, is it, it is an entire operating system that is designed to be everything from Stephen, North Carolina's very. Uh, I just wanted to, I just plugged the USB key in and I clicked a couple buttons and I just wanted to create a, a central place for all of my family to store all of their stuff, even the people that aren't ready to move off the Macs yet, as well as my new Linux boxes. But FreeNAS will scale all the way up to we have you know, large computing environments that have thousands and thousands of, of users and they're using FreeNAS and they have not outgrown it. So it's, it is a, it, it has a simple web UI. It's no, di I, I describe it to a lot of people as being no different than your home router to set up. You literally open up the web, web interface, click on shares, add new share, give it a name, set up some username and passwords if you want any authentication at all, because you certainly don't have to have it. And it, then it's browsable from any machine. Okay. Um, if I just need to move my files over from the Mac to the Linux, is there any special way? I, I've got external drives that I could use for that, but is there a best way to format those files system-wise? Yeah. Interestingly enough, that, that, that question sounds like it should be really simple. And in fact, you may find that that is a bigger headache than, um, then you might think it should be, and, and I'll tell you why. There are not a lot of file systems that play nicely between all three operating systems. There are some that will work between Windows and Linux. There are some that will work between Mac and Linux, some that work between Windows and Mac. But there, are, I can't think of a solid file system. Well, I can, but which I'm going to tell you, but that ruins the show. Uh, there are not a lot of file systems that that will go across all of the machines uh, simultaneously. And before I, you know, before I'd recommend you go out and buy a bunch of drives and build a free NAS box. I would ask you, is this just to move data from one computer to the other and then you're done? Or is this kind of an ongoing thing you'd like to have a continual backup, a continual central place to, to store your data? Because if the answer is, well, I just am going to do this one time, <clears throat> probably wouldn't spend the money or the time or the effort or the resources to build out an entire file server. I'd just plug in a drive. The, the, that's a really long way of answering your question, which is you want to use extended FAT. That is probably the most universal file system between the between all three operating systems. And uh, as long if you have the only time you're going to run into any issues if, is if you start getting into like um, if you have like 30, 30 gig uh, Blu-ray rips. Uh, sometimes you know some of the really high high. Oh no no nothing that yeah. big no, nothing okay. like that nothing. Yeah, ex extended fat then is probably what you want to do. It will it, it is readable between Windows Mac and Linux, um, and so you won't have any issues. There is one small package you have to install in Linux. It's just a single command, and I'll have that in the, the show notes for you as well. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the help. Thank, thank you, sir. We appreciate your call. Again, you, can, you too can be a part of the program. Ask your question at 1-855-450-NO. It's 855-450-6624 or email us live at asknoahshow.com. Mark calls from Maine. Hey, Mark, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, Noah. How are you doing? Excellent, sir. How are you? Okay, okay. I had a question about finding a replacement for Outlook. So I work at a small business in which we have a bunch of Windows machines that are slowly migrating on to Linux. As I've introduced them into the business, people are finding it has potential. So uh, some of the clients they work with use their email system only works with Outlook, you know, using whatever strange protocol Microsoft came up with, whatever it's called, OWS or something. Mm -hmm. It's not Map, it's not IMAP, it's not POP. And uh, I've played around with Thunderbird trying to get things to work, but I haven't struck across anything that that really does work for these cases. Do you have you ever come across this issue, and how have you solved that? If so, yes. Yeah, so. Uh the 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 uh, mail service that you're using be it exchange or whatever it does not support imap no 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 it's it's not our mail server it's the ones we tech talk to for our clients they have their own email servers and and 
you know, most of them use use POP or IMAP or they support it, uh, but some do not. Some are just strictly Exchange uh, Outlook web services only. And so I can't get those to work with Thunderbird, and that's kind of a, an issue for our business. So does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it does. I mean, so here's the easy answer. The easy cop-out answer is that uh, you could use Office 365 um, and use Outlook in there, and they have a free version that you can just sign up for an account for. And and that would technically, you know, obviously that's going to integrate into any sort of Microsoft environment. But that's not a great answer. I don't like that answer. But that's the short answer. Mm -hmm. um, the answer I like better is let's figure out why it is that th there is no IMAP support because I've done some pretty heavy, I've worked in some pretty heavy exchange environments, both hosted exchange and on, on premise exchange. And all of them have, we've always been able to enable IMAP uh, f to, to let outside people in. Now, the, one of the tricks that I have used, because a lot of times you'll get, you'll get this answer. Well, we want to uh, we want to enable IMAP, and they'll say, "Well, you can't do that because uh, we don't. There's a security risk, or our IT guy doesn't want to, or so and so doesn't want to support it, or whatever." And the way that we've kind of weaselled our way around that problem is we have said, "Well, so and so has you know a BlackBerry or some oddball device that that ha that doesn't support." Outlook Mobile, um, and we said, well, this, this person needs to, you know, this this user needs to get on here, and so uh, could we enable it for this guy? And typically, Linux isn't uh, isn't a great motivator, but some oddball mobile OS for whatever reason is. Um, and I'm not guaranteeing that's that's a workable solution. It may not even be a possibility for you. Um, but I, again, I've not seen an Exchange environment that you can't enable IMAP. It just may not be on for a policy issue. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it comes down to their IT team, you know, supporting this, and and so far they they don't care. They haven't even responded to some of my emails. So um, sure. Yeah, I guess I guess I guess probably using you know 365 online is probably going to be the best answer, at least you know for a business. Um, yeah, I'm it, IT teams want to get on board. I've made a case yeah. to you know use more and more Linux desktops in our business, and they are sure. working. But gosh, that darn Outlook issue has become kind of a you know, uh, stumbling block for that. To yeah, it it is it, it is it's a pain. And then the other thing too that you run into, and you know, is that you find that a lot of people really get invested in their workflow. And the calendaring system and mail system of Outlook isn't actually all that terrible from a usability standpoint. Uh, every once in a while, you'll have somebody's PST just blow up and then Outlook stops working and then they get super upset. And then another thing to be aware of is that no matter how it, it's hosted, unless it is hosted on a actual exchange, if, you, if you're using anything else with Outlook, it doesn't, it doesn't store tasks Actually, I want to say even on Exchange, it's, the tasks aren't st stored locally. And so if you ever have a corruption at the client level, if you're not using profile redirection, you'll actually lose uh, a lot of that. Uh, you know, you lose your Outlook configuration, and part of that is tasks. I don't think those are stored on Exchange. So there, there, are, there are a couple little pitfalls, and that can be fighting an uphill battle. In fact, I'm working with a client right now. They're on an Office 365 environment, and we are slowly dragging them off of it, and it is... It is it is fighting tooth and nail, but like I say, Microsoft has gotten a lot more friendly towards desktop Linux, and as part of that, they do allow you to use their uh, their web based uh, client for free. And so, uh, and, and I actually have an account at Office three sixty five just so I can kind of keep tabs on it. It's not terrible. Uh, it's not great. I'd rather have a local uh, thing that runs so I can get push notifications and, and all of those things. But uh, it is what it is, and in in the world we live in, at least we're never really that far from being connected. Oh wow, that's that's uh, it's interesting to hear. Uh, by by the way, on another note, I I just want to um, take up last week's discussion about about Linus leaving, which was very thought provoking. By the way, uh, you raise a lot of good points. Um, I I thought that uh, Steve Jobs was an interesting comparison here. With, I'm sorry to switch topics like that. I, I just um, no, you're fine. Just way too much. <laughs> so Steve Jobs was anything but a code of conduct type, and you know he he could get away with literally murder. Uh, well, not literally, but in, in figuratively. And yet he 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 managed to to you know bring Apple up from what it was. You know whether you like Apple or not, he de definitely brought the business up. Uh, but oh, absolutely. that didn't happen over. You know,
niceties. It happened over merit. And, and you know, I, I thought nobody seemed to really see that parallel. And so, I, you know, well, what are your thoughts on that? No, that's a great point. No, that's an excellent point. I'm glad you bring that up. Because the reality is what we are fighting here is not a technical issue. What we are fighting here is a human issue and a policy issue. And the, the parallel to, that you draw and why I think it's such a fantastic example, and I thank you for bringing it up, is that in a private company, nobody would think twice if somebody fired somebody else for performing less than exemplary work. But for whatever reason, inside of the open source community, what we end up doing is because I think largely due to the fact that a lot of people contribute their time and efforts and code and work for free, I think a lot of times as the recipient of that work that we start to feel entitled to it. And if we feel entitled to it, then we also feel a sense of entitlement to be able to contribute to those projects, right? We don't respect the idea yeah. that maybe some people are less valuable if they are not allowed to contribute. And I don't say if, if you can point to me, if somebody can exemplify for me where Linus Torvalds told somebody that they shouldn't contribute code because they had the wrong color skin or because they had the wrong genitals or because they had the, they were from the wrong born from the wrong country or they were the wrong age. I, I would be willing to have. I, I, I could see the argument more clearly where it becomes difficult for me to understand the argument is when you start to get into it with some of these people, they seem to be under the impression that just because somebody is of, you know, of, of a given skin color or of a given gender or of a given birthplace, that that person should be in, to entitled to more protection um, from uh, essentially online chastising for bad code than somebody who is who is born from a different place or has a different gender and, and that argument is like a it's a seg fault in my brain i just i can't really process why that is and um and so that that's where i think that discussion is is interesting but and i said this last week on the episode i feel the need to repeat it it's it's that at the end of the day i'm not a code contributor so i don't I don't I guess I don't really care what works best for the Linux developer community. If the people that could contribute code and the people that produce the product feel that this code, covenant code of conduct is the best way to go and they're all very happy with it and it produces a better product, then they have my full support. Where my support is going to dwindle is when I if I find out that Linus Torvalds, the creator, the maintainer and the driver of the Linux kernel is forced back out of his seat and is in and, and, and doesn't feel welcome into his own community or feels pushed out because of what I would call his disability, his inability to relate on a social level the way that maybe you or I would. If he is discriminated against because of his disability and because it offends other people, that's where I'm really going to come down, take a hard, hard stance and say, listen, this is wrong. This is bad. And when Steve Jobs passed away, Apple went downhill. If Linus Torvald steps away, Linux is going to go downhill. That's, I think, where I'm really going to get excited and passionate. At the moment, I'm kind of just sitting on the fence and looking and going, I see points over here. I see points over there. I see benefits. I see detractions. Let's just wait and kind of see how it plays out. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And last I checked, Linus is not uh, immortal. I think he's mortal, so he'll die eventually. And then what's going to happen? So, <laughs> yeah, that's oh, that's an that's another excellent point, man. If you you know what, if Mark, if I ever need if I ever need a day off, I'm I'm giving you a call. You can step in for me. I thank you very much for the call. But that's another excellent point. At one point or another, we were going to lose Linus. I guess what rubs me about it wrong this time is that it would be it it, it is an artificial first foot out the door, and it didn't need to be. And I I would just like to think that as Linux users, especially as very technical people. I, I wish that we could look past the artificial. I wish that we could look past the, you know, these these um, artificial blocks and just look towards merit and just look towards good code and say this is technically superior to that. And um, I feel like if we started doing that, a lot of these discussions would just kind of solve themselves. one 450 no it's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. John calls from Toronto. Hey, John, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Sorry, sorry, John. I have to I have to click the button there. There we go. Okay, now welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, Noah. How are you doing? Excellent, sir. How are you? Can you hear me? Good, good. 
So um, a couple of episodes back ago, you, uh, there was a gentleman who called in with the issue of uh, Linux Mint and the Google search scenario. Yes. And uh, you, yeah, and you had mentioned that uh, kind of you weren't you know, like a big fan of you know Linux Mint, so I kind of wanted to call in to ask uh, you know like what uh, you know distros do you like, and you know what what distros do you use on a you know as a daily driver? Sure. Sure, that's a great question. Fantastic question. Um, the the first distro that we that we talk about, anytime we start talking about distro or distro hopping or getting started with Linux, I always point people towards Ubuntu proper. And when I say Ubuntu proper, okay. I mean the Ubuntu as canonical sees Ubuntu's implementation. So today, that is Ubuntu with the GNOME desktop. Yesterday, that was uh, okay. Ubuntu with the Unity desktop. And the reason that I... Uh, the reason... John, that I always recommend Ubuntu first, particularly Ubuntu proper, is because that is where you're going to find the widest range of support. If you, When you start Googling around uh, to try to f solve problems on Linux, what you're going to find is 95% of the problems, and I do mean 95% of them, have been solved on Ubuntu proper. And then all of the other distributions do the best they can to solve those problems. Some of them make it, some of them don't. Now, there are people like me who have been doing this for a very long time, and I have, I, I have solved a lot of these problems on Ubuntu, and I'm able to kind of work my way through those problems on other distributions. And so, for other reasons that may or may not be appropriate for other people, I have, I don't, know, I don't want to say evolved, but I have, I have shaped my opinions to 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 run a different operating system. And so, right now, what I'm running is Kubuntu or Ubuntu with the KDE operating system or the KDE desktop. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that there are technical limitations of GNOME that I can't get past, and it was it was stopping me from getting my work done. I'll give you one example. The way that GNOME 3 is implemented with Wayland, if you lose a window and it, and it is running, uh, if, if, if a window crashes because it's all running under a single thread, the, your entire desktop bounces, crashes essentially, you get dropped back to the logon screen, you lose all your work. And that is a very, very frustrating experience. Now, my wife, who is 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 a very intellegent woman, and has she she part owner of Alta Speed Technologies, has been doing this almost as long as I have, just from the sales and and billing side of it, not from the the technical side, has has her own very strong opinions about why I'm wrong to 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 go off on my KDE route and why she is a huge proponent of GNOME, and uh, she. Her argument would be that Canonical, so far, has not transitioned to to Wayland as a default display server because of some of these problems. So they're still using X. And by the time that they transition to Wayland as a default display server, they're going to have these problems solved. Now, how they get there, I don't understand. I don't think she understands. But she just knows from a business perspective, because she's got a good business mind, that that is the logical thing for them to do. And so she just trusts that they've been doing it for 20 years. They probably have a pretty good idea how to make an operating system by now. They'll get it right eventually. And I don't really have mm -hmm. an argument against that. So uh, that's that's how I wound up on KDE. Now, when we, got, we talk about servers, a lot of people, there's a, there's a good solid argument to be made about using the same operating system on a server that you use on the desktop because you can try things out, run it locally, test some things on your laptop or on a machine, and then those skills immediately translate to a server. There's also something to be said about muscle memory. Typing sudo apt-get every single time works both when you're SSH in on your server as well as on your laptop. I was professionally trained as a system administrator on Red Hat. So my skill set and my knowledge and my my way or my understanding of how to implement technology really is based on a Red Hat centric environment. So anytime I'm working on servers, it's always Red Hat for me or CentOS, which is a binary compatible version of Red Hat. They essentially take the Red Hat source code, strip out all of the Red Hat logos and then recompile it into a, a a quote-unquote new operating system, but it does exactly the same thing that Red Hat does. In fact, so much so that in official Red Hat training courses, they actually teach you to use CentOS to try and test things. Um, and so for servers, I have always run CentOS. And what I found after years and years of doing this, and I, I would, I'll gladly uh, challenge anybody on this, is that the people that are running Ubuntu on the servers, typically it's fine you know, when you first get it started out. And the, the argument of there is more people have solved problems on Ubuntu than any other operating system still stands true. However, 
if you want a box to live for 10 or 15 years, like really, really long, I have not seen as many Ubuntu boxes do that as I have seen CentOS boxes do that. And even, dare I say it, even though this isn't a good idea, even though it's not a recommendation, Fedora boxes. I see a lot of really old Fedora boxes. There's actually a POS company that makes um, point of sale systems all based on Fedora. It's an ancient, like Fedora Core 4, some ridiculously old thing. Um, but those are still in production. And, and so having seen the longevity of CentOS and Red Hat puts a lot of thought and a lot of effort into making sure that you're still able to run Red Hat 5 10 years later without any real major problems. And they're going to provide security patches and backports and all of those things. So for all of those reasons, because I don't particularly care for change and I like to have rock solid reliability and stability, I tend to use CentOS on the servers. Mm -hmm. And then I do have an Archbox because if you ever really want to learn about Linux just for the fun of it, then you got to install uh, Arch, uh, you know, that, that, anyway, that, that, that would be my answer. Okay. Well, thank you for your time tonight. Yeah, man. Thanks for the call. 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 855 450 Or you can send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. Matt calls from Arizona. Hey, Matt, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hello, Noah. How are you today? I'm doing great. How's Matt doing? Oh, he's doing pretty well today. So I have a couple of questions. I also have a comment. Uh, a gentleman at the beginning of the program uh, had just been introduced to guitar, to guitar sound. Uh, whenever that comes on to my playlist in the car, I always crank the music up and I always usually restart the track anyways. So <laughs> great song. Um, questions follow. So C file, I know you're a proponent of it and I know yes. that you, uh, espouse it. So what I'm wondering is, do you run it on bare metal or do you run it in a container? I've done it both ways. I, my purse, I have two C file instances that I use every day. I have my personal C file instance, which has personal files that my family and I use. That is in our, uh, it's in our um, server room at Alta Speed Technologies. It's on a 1U Mr. Rackables $99 server, Atom server deal uh, that I got off of eBay and uh, just have a four, I think it was a eight terabyte Western Digital Red in there. And that's running on bare metal. But I also have a, another machine, which is a, it's a rented bare metal machine, but on top of the Brented bare metal machine, we have virtualized a bunch of, uh, we've installed libvirt D and virtualized the entire machine to create a bunch of virtual servers because frankly, Matt, my digital ocean bill got to be hundreds of dollars a month and it just, <laughs> and it just got to be insane. And so digital ocean is great when you're starting out, but there does come a point where you just look at it and say, I could buy a server every three months for the amount of money I'm paying to rent these digital ocean droplets. And then the issue becomes, how do you get the amount of IP addresses and rack space to host this stuff. And so OVH has a fantastic deal. You can rent a server. I think it's, I think we pay 28 bucks a month. It might actually be through Kim, Kim Sufi, not actual OVH. So basically the way that's structured is they take their servers from OVH and when they get older, then they move them to a, like a budget site called Kim Sufi and they run them on and they, they put them on there. But I think we only pay like 30 bucks a month or 35 bucks a month for our, our, our in-house Alta speed server. And uh, that one uh, that's on Kim Sufi, we have virtualized and we run an OVH or a, um, a uh, C file instance on it and it runs flawlessly. And then we have a third computer, which is a bare metal computer. It is a Dell R710, I think. And that is the one that we have. It's loaded up with like 48 terabytes of disk space or whatever. And that is the machine that if you call, if you contacted one eight six six two eight zero fourteen thirty three and uh, and you know talk to the sales departments and said, hey, I want to sign up for C file. Can you sign me up? That's the machine that we would put you on. And that is also a bare metal installation. So I've done it both ways. The reason for choosing bare metal over virtualized is just. Are you going to only use that machine for C file? Are you going to utilize all the resources on C file or would you ever want to split it up? In the case of our in-house company server, we just have, we have OS ticket we have to run. We have C file we have to run. We have, uh, you know, simple help that we have to run. All of those things have to run on a server. And so it just makes more sense for us to build a really big server, virtualize it up, create a second virtual host, and then mirror it so that if our primary host ever goes down, we have a, a failover system. That's a, that's a very good good answer. I appreciate that. So the issue or the, the, the situation that I'm facing right now is that my father-in-law gave me a Mac tower. Uh, he was basically said that it 
crashed on him. If you can fix it, it's yours. So I took it, I fixed it, and I have Fedora server running on it right now. And, and uh, I had attempted previously to run C file through the Docker container that you can download uh, directly through the, the Docker instances on Fedora. And whenever I would try and launch it through the, the, the terminal using the arguments to uh, make a specific directory, uh, the, the C file op C file uh, directory, the, the main directory for it to use, it would always error out with some sort of an issue where it wasn't able to, uh, they didn't have permission basically to write directories into that subdirectory. So I'm th I think this next time I'm going to try and go the route of um, bare metal and we'll see how that goes. Yeah, and and to be clear, when I say I'm running not on bare metal, I, I'm I've, I've installed setting up a virtual system, and maybe we should maybe we'll do this on the air someday, just because it is so brain dead simple. Sometimes I'll get into conversations with people, we'll start talking about virtualization. They'll say, "Yeah, I'd sure like to learn how to do that someday." It's four commands. I can give you those four commands. You can copy and paste them into a running CentOS box, and you'll have a virtual host. And you literally install one again, another single command to install a a, a, a graphical piece of software on your laptop, and then you have graphical buttons that you can add new server, create this, download this ISO, all that. Um, and that's what we're using. When I say I'm virtualizing, that's what I'm doing. It's not actually containerized install. I would imagine that your errors are coming from the Docker install. What I'll do for you, Matt, is I will include our installation because we do, not only do we do hosted C file for companies, we'll get calls all the time from companies that will say, hey, we're on Dropbox. We now, There's an architecture firm. It's a great example. This is just a couple of months ago was on Dropbox, and they started to become concerned that they were storing a lot of uh, confidential client data on Dropbox. Came to us and said, do you have any security? Is there any, are there any security concerns here? We said, absolutely there are security concerns. We definitely wouldn't do that. So what would you recommend? They said, well, we could sign you up for our C file hosted service. You pay the same, less than you pay for Dropbox, and we'll give you uh, access. You can do all that stuff. Well, if we don't trust Dropbox, why should we trust you? I don't have a great answer for that. I, I guess I wouldn't. If, if, if it's really that private, I guess I would suggest that you own your own infrastructure. And they said, well, how can we do that? We said, yeah. well, what we do is we buy, you'd buy a server and we just come set it up for you. And so that we do that all the time. And so we just have a, our knowledge base actually has a, a, a list. We've linked to it a couple of times in the show notes, but our knowledge base at Ultraspeed Technologies, we have quick guides for just it. There's no descriptions. It's not going to teach you how to do anything, but it's like a monkey see, monkey do. Take these commands, paste them into the a, a terminal, and at the end, you you'll have a, a working C file server. And so I will include the C file setup yeah. instructions in this week's episode of the Ask Noah Show show notes. You can head over to podcast.asknoahshow.com, check those out. And uh, if you choose to do it either on bare metal or in a virtualized environment, that's what I'd suggest you do. That's that's how, how I would suggest you do it, I guess. Mm, absolutely. So I have another question on a different yeah, sure. topic if you've got time. I do. So uh, OBS. Uh, I've I've heard about it. I've I've downloaded it. I've tried to to use it previously this last weekend in a production for my church. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to get it figured out in time, so we had to fall back on on other matters. Uh, but the question or the problem that I was having was: Does it support streaming like it like it does, and then also pushing that same stream to a local HDMI output? So basically, we've got the, the machine in our command center that we were wanting to push everything through, then streaming it to the other building that we were streaming it to, but then also be able to push what we were doing uh, through the local HDMI system and be able to, brought, to push it into the different rooms throughout the building. The answer to your Does question... OBS do that? Yes, that's the, that's the short answer. The way to do that, inside of OBS, what you do is on the main preview screen where you where you're seeing your video come out. If you right click on that screen, one of the th you'll, you, at the very top you'll say enable preview and that obviously you want that on. But like the third or fourth option down is full screen projector. And if you hover over that, it will give you a list of all of the available display devices that are attached to the machine. So let's say, for example, you have your primary monitor, which is connected to, I'll call it a DVI port, and also on your video card, you also have an HDMI port. As long as you have a TV or a projector or a, another monitor or whatever connected to that um, HDMI port, you are going to see display zero, display one, display two, however many you have. And if you check under full screen projector, if you click on one of those devices, it will turn that screen 
into a preview device of whatever your whatever is whatever is being broadcast essentially um, and that's actually how we used to do it at JB1 right here in the studio is we used to have a, a, a screen mm -hmm. that would be in front of our face underneath the camera that we could see what was actually going out over the stream. That's how we did it. We did it with that full screen preview projection. If you ever have a chance to visit us at Linux Fest Northwest, um, we always have a, a screen up behind us, uh, behind the booth. And on that screen, we're showing reruns and we're showing a, a live a picture of the feed as we're doing it. Again, that's how we're doing it. We're doing it that live projector mode. So yeah, OBS is very much capable of that. It's a very powerful piece of software it can be a little confusing when you're getting your head first wrapped around it. Yeah, it, it certainly was. Uh, so now I'm beginning to wonder if I didn't have my output HDMI cable plugged into my input port on the, the video capture card. Right, yeah, yeah. and so so that's, yeah, that's a, well, no, 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 no. First of all, I have done that, and, and this is coming from somebody who would call himself a broadcast engineer and goes out and sets this up for other people, and I've done exactly that, so I wouldn't feel bad about that. The other thing that I have run into is some of the capture cards, like the Black Magic ones, are are, are pretty uh, pretty notorious for this. They have a, a they have an output, but OBS for whatever reason sometimes will not see that output unless you have the proper updated driver software package thingy installed. And so um, I'm a la I'm a very lazy human being. Uh, Matt, if I'm being honest with you, and so what I have always done is just I bypass the problem by just buying motherboards that have both a DVI port and a HDMI port or buying a motherboard that doesn't have any outputs and I just put a video card in it that has two video outputs because I'm lazy. But if I wasn't lazy, I would go through and troubleshoot why that that output on the capture card isn't showing up and figure it out. And you, I'm sure you can get it to work that way. Again, I'm just lazy. No, it, 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 uh, it sounds like this is turning into a uh, uh, user's anonymous for lazy people. Hi, Noah. Yes. My, my name is Matt. I'm a lazy engineer. <laughs> well. so. I love it, Matt. Thanks for the call, Matt. So, uh, that's a different show. 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. You too can add your voice to the conversation. Uh, James calls uh, from uh, Idaho. Hey, James, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Yeah, um, I'm trying to figure out if it's uh, my end or Jingle Broadcasting, and I'm, my research is getting to the Jingle Broadcasting. HLS Air 4. Okay, you're getting this when you're trying to play the live stream? You're getting an error? Yeah, um, yeah. and right. I was trying to figure out if it's my, me, oh, my browsers are good. Let me ask you this, James, because I was actually, this was an announcement yeah. I was going to say for the end of the show, but since you bring it up, we'll talk about it. Um, are, do you. When you watch the show, do you actually watch the show, or do you just you stream it on the site and then you go do other things where you kind of listen to it in the background? Um, I do a combination. It depends upon what I'm doing. Half the time I'm actually watching it, though, half the time I'm just like, okay, but just put the you know the, just in the background. <laughs> sure. Here's here's so here's why half and half. I tell you why I tell you why I bring that up, and I, I thank you very much for the call, and I thank you for that question because that that brings us to uh, to a really exciting um, I don't know apex in the Ask Noah show that I'm excited to talk about. Um, I have been receiving a lot of feedback, uh, and the feedback ranges everything from I have problems uh, streaming the Flash site. I don't want to stream Flash because I, I am philosophically opposed to it, and you do this entire show about free and open source, and then you have this embedded Flash stream that I can't watch. And people complain about it that way. And then the last thing, and this I've been hearing more and more and more, is I want to stream on a mobile device. I want to stream on a satellite connection or on a MiFi connection, and I don't have the bandwidth to pull a 720p video, nor do I really want a 720p video. I just want to listen to the audio. My answer to that up until this point, the best answer I could give you up until this point is to go to asknoahshow.com and listen to the audio stream there or go to the Jupiter Broadcasting audio stream and listen to the audio stream there. There are caveats with both of those answers, which is why I typically don't haven't really talked about it on the air. And the caveat is that not, not a lot of priority or effort is put into either of those two places. Um, it's just kind of an auxiliary place. It's it's kind of best effort. We we religiously check the you know the main JB Live, live site. We religiously check uh, you know for streaming on YouTube and stuff like that. Those things we do. 
Um, but I, I, for whatever reason, it, it's and, and I'm, I do it just as much as uh, as JB does. We just have never really uh, put a lot of effort or 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 time uh, or priority into the audio streams. And as of next week, that is going to change. I uh, I spoke with uh, a gentleman who does broadcast engineering for a living, and um, he has spent a lot of time and made a lot of money going to radio stations and podcast uh, studios, setting up. Uh, streaming professional grade uh, live streaming um, with excellent audio quality. I don't necessarily like um, the little round puck lady that everybody has in their house, but I am at a point in my life where I can no longer deny that if we're going to do a live call in radio show, then we need to be able to have two way interaction with our uh, audience and that audience may want to participate or want to, at the very least, listen to us on a smart speaker. And so we need to be there. And if we're going to be there, I, I don't do anything haphazardly. If I'm going to do it, we're going to do it right. And we looked at the capital investment of it. We said, this is a lot of money. It's a lot of money to get a really high quality stream over very low bandwidth. And so we looked at a couple different options. We looked at some streaming providers that would do multi-bit rate uh, streaming. So we would, you know, we'd, you'd have to pick a 64 kilobit or a 128 or a 320 or whatever. The problem with doing that is, again, you start to wind up with, you go to a site and, it, you know, you're going to go listen to the, the, the show and there's 15 options to choose from. That was my problem originally when we first lost, launched the Ask Noah Show and why we created the Ask Noah Show dashboard was to make everything simple, straightforward and easy for you guys to use. So it kind of felt like I was throwing that effort away if, 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 if I went that route, but it would mean we didn't have to buy any equipment. Um, so this week, actually, just before I got here, before I landed in Seattle, had a very uh, serious discussion with the production crew that works on the Ask Noah Show. Had a very serious discussion with the production people that work for Alta Speed Technologies who kindly, because I write their checks, uh, engineer and, and make sure all of the technical aspects of the show go out. And we just decided that this is something that we have to do. We have to invest in that final mile. We've put thousands, tens of thousands of dollars into the studio, into the production workflow. All of that thing, all of those things are nice and professional and sound great and fantastic. And everything is great up to the fact where the, the final end product, we release these products because we compress them down um, to a very low bit rate. Uh, because that's what Fireside requires us to do before we publish them as a podcast. And then if you tune into the live show, you don't really get a great experience as far as audio quality there either. If you're, if you're doing the audio only show. And um, so we, we just looked at it a little bit and said, okay, this is what we have to do to, to make it right. So we ordered the equipment. I talked to the sales representative um, from the uh, from the broadcast manufacturer, he said that they have it in stock. They are shipping it. It is supposed to ship today, uh, and he's going to send me a tracking number, all of those things. So I will be back in Grand Forks uh, at the end of this week. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time. We're going to tear into the studio. We are going to install this thing. We are going to have this gentleman who specializes in broadcast streaming come in, and he is going to – we're going to add processing – to the live stream so it will sound it will be the my goal is to have the best sounding live stream of any podcaster out there and i we have all of the equipment to do it up till that final mile we just need to get that final mile it's going to cost a little bit of money but we're going to get it done and so i would invite you next week to listen to ask noah show at asknoahshow.com and there what you're going to find is an extraordinarily low bit rate but very high quality stream. It should sound the best that we've ever sounded. And I want to create an experience so that the live audience shows up for the show and listens to the show live. I want to start encouraging more participation. This week was fantastic. We took calls the entire hour. I had a whole show prepped of things to talk about and we didn't get to a single thing because all we did was take your calls. And I love it. That is the show I set out to do. That is the show I want to do. That is the show I want to create. And the way to do that, I think is to create a very high quality, warm, welcoming environment where all questions are welcome, literally all questions and all points of discussion are welcome. Sometimes I think that doesn't come across. Sometimes I think because we called the show Ask Noah, it implies that you have to have a question in order to call the show. I would love nothing more than if we're talking about a topic for somebody to pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, you're talking about this thing and I don't agree with you. You're talking about the code of conduct and you're wrong and here's why you're wrong. And we can have that discussion on the air. I'm perfectly okay with that. And in order to do that, 
I know that we have to create a warm, welcoming live environment. There has to be some advantage for you to take an hour out of your day, especially at the end of your work day, and show up and listen to the show live. And a lot of people, I, I, I guess, sometimes I think that people don't think that I understand and appreciate the fact that they're taking time out of their day, but every single listener that has called this program since day one, there isn't a day that I wake up and get out of bed and I'm not immensely grateful that you guys and gals are out there and supporting this show. And those of you who download the show afterwards and listen to the show and provide feedback, we're very grateful for that as well because you have literally helped direct and drive the show. You can make a suggestion. We set that up. We don't talk about it much, but asknoahshow.com slash better. When we first launched that, I thought for sure it was going to be a dumpster fire. I thought people would write in with the most vicious, hateful things ever. And it turns out you guys had some of the most insightful, amazing suggestions that allowed us to refocus and rehone the show to deliver the product that you want. And what I'm hearing right now, what I have heard over the past uh, couple weeks and over the past couple months is that we want a very high quality live stream. We want live content. We want it done well. We want it done right. And something without dropouts, something that doesn't have to refresh, something you don't have to reload your browser, something that I can run on a mobile device. We're going to push to the apps like TuneIn. We're going to push to apps. Uh, we've experimented. I, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but we've experimented with the idea of launching an Ask you Noah Show app that would have an integrated chat room so you could chat with us, that you could listen to the live show. If the show isn't live, you would just get the latest downloaded episode. We've looked into all of that. The, the, the part that I struggle with there is I wouldn't download that app. I, I don't want any more apps on my phone. I got plenty of apps. So I wouldn't want one for one show that happens once a week. But I wouldn't mind. I already have things like TuneIn. So it'd be pretty great if you could just listen to the show in an app that has integration with your phone. So it has play and pause functionality. It has the ability to interrupt, hold the stream wherever the show left off. You can take your phone call or whatever thing comes up and then you can go back to the show. Those kind of things I think are valuable. And those are the kind of things that I want to do. And so all of that is going to be launched next week. We're super excited about it. Again, we're trying to do it as fast and, and as efficiently, but without sacrificing any quality as we can. And uh, I, I, of course, I'd be interested in your feedback, whether you like the idea or dislike the idea, or if you have something I haven't thought of and say, this is what it would take for me to show up live. This is what it would take for me to participate in the show. Make sure to head over to asknoahshow.com, use the contact link, and let us know what you're thinking. Again, phone lines are open, 1-855-450-NOAH, it's 855-450-6624, the email live at asknoahshow.com. Uh, last but not least, um, our logo competition is coming to an end. We had a bunch of, an ama a bunch of amazing entries, and I want to thank each and every one of you who entered uh, that competition. Essentially, what we asked you to do was submit your take on the, uh, on the um, AltaSpeed logo, and uh, we would, uh, we would select from that uh, drawing base and uh, and then move forward with refreshing the ultra speed logo for our 10 year anniversary which is coming up next year now that uh, essentially the graphic design people and the website people and, and all of the people that that do all of their various things are itching and chomping at the bit to get started and I've told them they need to wait until November and so uh, the, the the deadline if you still have if you've been thinking about doing it but haven't gotten around to it net yet is November 1st. We need to have those entries by November 1st. Um, if I don't, if we don't see any entries at all through October, because they've kind of, I think they've kind of dried up. I think everybody that wanted to submit an entry has. Um, then, uh, th then we might move that back just a little bit with the with the stipulation that if something incredible comes in before the first of November, obviously we'll consider it. Uh, Lt guy 005 in the chat room asks if we have 10 year t-shirts, not 10 year t-shirts. We have ultra speed t-shirts. They're not, I don't think they're particularly clever. Uh, they just say ultra speed runs my network. But if that's interesting to you, you, we, we'd send you one, shoot me your address, just uh, send an email to ultra speed. Of course we have asked no shirt t-shirts. I'll send you one of those too. Um, but, uh, that, that's the deadline for the, uh, for the ask Noah show or the uh, ultra speed technologies logo competition. The other thing I mentioned this real quick, we are having a competition. We're going to give $80 to our eight, hundredth member in the telegram group we're going to give 160 dollars that's 80 times two to one of the people that are in our telegram group you can join by going to telegram.asknoahshow.com right now it's at 7.99 so the very next person that joins telegram will win that gift card hey did you know this episode is available as a downloadable podcast that's right to subscribe to the feed or download the latest episode visit podcast.asknoahshow.com 
There you'll find not only the latest episodes, but all the articles and materials referenced in this episode. You can get the latest, of course, by following us on Twitter at Ask Noah Show. The Ask Noah Show continues next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. A huge thanks to Vox Telesis for providing our phone systems, Ben, our producer, Sarah, our call screener. This hour of the show may be over, but there's plenty of more content for you 24-7 at AskNoahShow.com. 